Welcome to our Sunday service. I'm Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Chetwin. Let's open with prayer. Oh Lord, we're so grateful for this season. We're so grateful for your son's sacrifice for each one of us. Equip and prepare us for each day with your strength and your wisdom. Amen. We are rapidly closing in on the Easter season when we remember the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus has announced to his disciples that they're headed for Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. He knows what lies ahead. They don't. Mark 8, verse 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As the people were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you're one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Why would Jesus ask such a question? You see, it's not enough to know what others say about Christ. We must know. We must understand. We must accept personally that he is the Savior. We can often know something in our head, but it hasn't moved to our heart. It must move to commitment and adoration. It must be a settled deal, and Jesus wanted the disciples to really be committed to the path that lay ahead, not just for him, but for them as well. Then he warns them not to tell anyone about him. Why wouldn't Jesus want anyone but the disciples knowing for sure that he was the Messiah? Well, he knew the disciples needed more teaching, they needed to understand what his death and resurrection would accomplish. They didn't, still didn't understand fully what this would mean to the world at large. Until they did, they only had half of the salvation message. That's like reading a really good book and finding out that the last four or five chapters are missing. And Jesus knew that the time was very short. And we will see in the rest of this chapter just how little they really understood about Jesus' mission. We may think that it's strange since they had been with Jesus for three full years. They had followed him around as he performed miracles. They had listened to his teachings. They had eaten with him and they had hung on to every word. But if you think about it, we too have spent years, some of us many more than just three. And do we really think about what his de death and resurrection did for us? We see our first example of this lack of knowledge when we read the next couple of verses. Mark 8, 31 to 9, verse 1. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. Then reprimanded Peter, Get away from me, Satan, he said. You're seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. From this point on, Jesus was very clear with his message to the disciples about his death and resurrection. But at this particular moment, Peter wasn't thinking about God's purpose. He was thinking about his own. He wanted the King Jesus, but not the suffering servant that had been prophesied in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 12. He wanted the glory of following the Savior, but not the persecution. Without realizing it, the disciples were trying to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. But then, Jesus would not have fulfilled his mission on earth. Satan had tried this when he tried to tempt Christ. He wanted Jesus to avoid the cross too. The difference was that while Satan was motivated by evil, the disciples were motivated by love and admiration for him. 
However, disciples had a job to do, and that job was not to protect Jesus, but to follow him. They would come to realize why Jesus had to die, but they just weren't ready to accept that. So Jesus uses the image of carrying the cross to show them that complete submission is required of his followers. We're reminded that nothing, not even life itself, can compare to what we gain in Christ. We have to stop trying to control our own destiny and let him be our guide. Our very soul's eternity depends upon it. Whatever we have on earth is only temporary. Verse 38 gave us a choice. We can reject Jesus now, but the consequences are drastic. He will reject us later. We may think that it will make life easier for the moment, but in the long term, in the light of eternity, it has some horrific consequences. And we must remember that Jesus is coming back and that there is a day of reckoning. Mark 9, verse 2 to 12. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters in memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he really didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? You will notice that only three of the disciples accompanied Jesus to that high mountain, and it states in the very first verse that the purpose was to, was to be alone. Mountaintop experiences, even in the Old Testament, were associated with closeness to God and readiness to listen and be obedient. Good examples of this are Moses and Elijah. Jesus was not the reincarnation of Elijah or Moses. He was not merely one of the prophets or a great leader. He was God's son, and it reports here that he was talking with them. He is all authority and power. It's been given to him by the Father. Once again, Peter speaks up. He didn't speak because he had something important to say. He spoke because he didn't know what else to say, but he thought he had to say something, anything. Then once again, God spoke from the heavens with the words, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Then just as suddenly as they came, Moses and Elijah were gone. And as they walked down the mountain, Jesus cautions them not to tell anyone what they had seen until his resurrection. They did well with that. They didn't tell anyone. But here it does say that they did discuss it between themselves. Their, they, their question that they bounced around was, what did it mean? Rising from the dead. It would have been difficult to grasp the idea that the Messiah, the king, would have to suffer. All the Jews who studied the prophecies expected another great king like David. They were only looking at rescue for the time they lived in. They still couldn't wrap their heads around the values of, eter of an eternal kingdom. But Jesus knew that we needed to be delivered from sin. Sin would and still does affect every area of life, but it also affects eternal life as well. But now they had new assurance. They had heard God speak. They had seen a part, only a part, of the kingdom of God with the presence of Elijah and Moses on the mountain. So they continued their trudge down the mountain. And as they trudged, they went from a reassuring experience of God's presence to a frightening experience of evil. This would be a very important lesson for them. As our spiritual vision improves and allows us to see and understand God better, we will also be able to see and understand evil better. Mark 9, 14 to 29. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. 
What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cries out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil speak spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. I command you to come out of this child and never enter into him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. So why couldn't the disciples cast out the evil spirit? They had cast out demons before. Mark relates this narrative to indicate that the battle with Satan is an ongoing, difficult struggle. Victory over sin and temptation comes through faith in Christ, not through our efforts. Faith is an attitude of trust and confidence. Faith is a gift from God. But even with faith, we will never be self-sufficient. We can't stash faith away for a rainy day. Growing in faith, too, is an ongoing process. And prayer is the key that unlocks faith in our lives. It's easy to see why Jesus told the disciples not to tell others that he was the Messiah. In these few verses, in this chapter, we have seen just how much they still had to learn. And let's face it, the clock was ticking. There wasn't much time. This is a good reminder to each one of us as well. The clock is still ticking. Never will we be able to capture the whole picture of God, of his character, and of his love for us. That will only come to us when Christ returns but we can certainly continue to learn, continue to pray, continue to apply his directives, and continue to be obedient. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only solution for sin in our lives. Fill us with your love and with faith that it becomes very real to each of us and help us to learn to be good disciples. Amen.